All right, welcome everybody. We have a lot of updates about the East Palestine train crash and explosion. I'm watching this very closely because this reeks of social engineering. There are a couple of other possibilities I can't entirely rule out, but overwhelmingly, this strikes me as the ushering in of the next crazy government agenda. I'm calling it eco-fascism. And that's what I think this is all about ushering out. So I think they're setting a lot of traps, leaving a lot of bait, hoping people jump on this as being some scandalous government cover-up or them being grossly negligent in their response. But I think that's what this is all scripted to elicit from us. So I think falling into that trap and demanding the EPA step up and save us is a huge, huge mistake. In previous episodes, we've done deep dives into CERCLA and into other aspects of the East Palestine train crash. But in this video, I want to do an update with what I've seen come across my radar. I want to show you the clues that I've found that lead me to think that this is the beginning of an attack on property ownership and farming. Not to say that those haven't already been under attack, but this is a huge new angle that they're trying to bring into the mix. All right, so let's start with this press release that the CDC put out a few days ago on March the 13th. They say that they're further looking into the East Palestine train crash with their ATSDR agency. ATSDR stands for the Agency for Toxic Substances and Disease Registry. We've talked about them in prior videos, so make sure to go check those out. But I have learned a lot more that I want to share with you here, because I've been following all the press releases, the media coverage, with a very skeptical eye. I try to be discerning, because this absolutely reeks as a social engineering campaign. CDC and ATSDR staff began next steps in ACE investigation in East Palestine, Ohio. So the first question that got me digging here was, what is ACE? What's the ACE investigation? And it stands for the Assessment of Chemical Exposure. And so I kept pulling at this thread, and I want to show you what I found here. So here's one of the key quotes from their press release. While the CDC and ATSDR staff will be returning from the field, the ACE survey will remain online and data collection will continue until March the 31st. So what I think is really sad about this is a lot of these people might be filling out this questionnaire thinking that they're screwing over the train company who they feel victimized them. I don't think they really understand that this data might be used against the residents, the farmers, the American people. That's where I see this going. And we'll look at some of their data in a second, but I think they're going to try to correlate, hey, look at all these symptoms. Look at all these headaches. 76% of people had headaches. And correlate that with the levels of dioxin they found and try to associate the two. And then I worry that they'll drive people from their homes across the country in the coming decades because they find that level of dioxin. Something like that. That's where I see this going. It says, over the next couple of months, CDC and ATSDR will work with the health departments to analyze data and share results. So they're talking about the Pennsylvania and Ohio health departments. So this is the key line. I think they have foreknowledge. I think they know where this is going. And they're slowly dripping out these press releases, invoking powerful forces like reverse psychology, getting people angry. So they lash out, give the reaction to the problem reaction solution. These results can be used by the states to help inform public health recommendations and lessons learned. And I worry that this can lead to forced evacuations and equally bad restrictions on farming. I think that's a big aspect here and they're trying to drip this in to the story. We'll talk about that in a second. I think restrictions on farming and livestock raising is a big aspect here. Again, I think they have foreknowledge, they have a destination in mind, and they're trying to get there by any means necessary including coming out and saying, oh, everything's safe, everything's safe, and saying other things that piss people off and being slow with the cleanup, etc., so that people say, it's not safe. And I think that's the conclusion they want us to come to because that's the conclusion they want to come to. I'm very passionate about this. We're already seeing massive inflation in the price of food. And I think this is going to pour gasoline on that. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention and the Agency for Toxic Substances and Disease Registry are preparing for the next phase. That's never good, right? Preparing for the next phase of the assessment of chemical exposure, the ACE investigation, to assess the health impacts of the February 3rd train derailment. Starting this week, 
the CDC and the ATSDR will shift staff from the field to complete data analysis of the ACE investigation. CDC and ATSDR will continue to support the health departments in Ohio and Pennsylvania to address the public health needs of the region. So I find this very concerning. I see this all leading up to some sort of a forced evacuation and a limiting of farming and agriculture. So the CDC has this brief document on the ACE investigation methodology on their website. And I found this segment really, really concerning. Why do an ACE investigation? State and local health departments can use information obtained from rapid assessments to direct the public health response and assess the need to modify emergency response procedures. That really jumps out at me. And this is mirrored in the press release and reiterated. These ACE survey results can be used by the states to help inform public health recommendations. So this is an interesting document which shows how intertwined the EPA and the ATSDR are. So remember, the ATSDR is the CDC, which is a part of Health and Human Services. So I just want to read a couple highlights from this. Under EPA's objective to reduce or eliminate pollutants that could harm the environment and human health, Note how they put environment first. And that's a very powerful spell for them to do. Because the residents could say, hey, we have property ownership. We don't want you here. Our health is fine. Thank you very much. And the EPA can point at this and say, well, we're here for the environment, not for you. It reminds me of this article from The Guardian talking about this group called The Good Club, which is a bunch of billionaires trying to depopulate the world. But instead of saying they want to genocide swaths of humanity, The Guardian says, they want to save the world. And it talks about the, quote, problem of overpopulation. So note how they frame this. Well, we need to save the world. To hell with all the people we have to eradicate. We need to save the world. Okay, back to this document here. Under legislative mandate, ATSDR. CERCLA directs ATSDR to determine whether actions should be taken to reduce human exposure to hazardous substances from a facility and whether additional information on human exposure and associated health risks is needed and should be acquired. So the ATSDR determines whether actions should be taken to reduce human exposure. So that includes forced evacuations, which are just absolutely evil. So under legislative mandate under EPA, CERCLA requires EPA to assess permanent solutions resource recovery technologies that in whole or in part will result in a permanent and significant decrease in the toxicity, mobility, or volume of the hazardous substance. Key activities for the ATSDR provides public health expertise on sampling plans, cleanup options, public health measures, and the health implications of regulatory options to other federal agencies, including the EPA, state agencies, private organizations, and individuals. So not just the EPA, other federal agencies. So I'm guessing FEMA, under key activities for the EPA, establishes and enforces environmental regulations to mitigate or eliminate releases. EPA requires responsible entities to clean up or pay for cleanup of spills or releases. So in this case, everybody seems to hate this train company. And I get it. I think they're supposed to be the fall guy looking like the evil arch villain corporation. But don't forget these train routes and big trucks driving around on the highways are one of the major reasons that we can live as nicely as we do. The shipping industry is crucial for transporting goods and giving us some semblance of free trade. I wonder how much about this is purposefully shooting the shipping industry in the foot and thus all Americans getting shot in the foot. That's why we have to understand what really happened to the train, because if we let the transportation safety board tell us what to think, it might all be rigged to create solutions to something that's not even the problem in the first place. I think it's all rigged to solve the problem that's not even there. If the East Palestine train crash was intentional, treating it as a freak accident 
is not the right move. ATSDR conducts PHA public health assessment activities to direct action, direct action, to protect the health of the community. Purpose of the EPA, it says, conducts RA, which is risk assessment, activities to determine necessary cleanup and remedial actions, designate releases at NPL sites, enforce regulatory action, and hold entities legally responsible for environmental violations. So that's what I forgot to say just a second ago. Right now, it's the train company. But in the future, it might just be some farmer. They might just show up in some residential neighborhoods and say, well, we found dioxin in your backyard and we don't know where it came from. This is your property. You're liable. We're going to put a windfall lien after we clean it up. That's what I'm worried about. In the future, them finding people liable who are innocent and using this politically to drive tons and tons of people off their land and screw up the agricultural industry. So now we have reported the Ohio Department of Agriculture and the EPA are to test for dioxin up to six miles from the crash. This is with their so-called meeting with the farmers. I put out some clips if you haven't seen that. Quote, as soon as one of those tests comes back that causes a question mark, then that increases the testing. If there's things that we see, then it's going to trigger, that triggers a lot more. That's a quote from one of the executives over at the Ohio Department of Agriculture. And I found this document, I think it's really interesting and really telling. It's called ATSDR, Safeguarding Communities from Chemical Exposures. And remember right now, all the news is saying the ATSDR is in Ohio doing ACE work, assessment of chemical exposure. So this is one of their terms and it's what they're doing right now in Ohio. So I find this very interesting. This is a new talking point that we keep hearing about. Oh my gosh, these chemical exposures are affecting so many millions of Americans. They're affecting so many people around the world. WHO says a lot of these same false authorities that have screwed us over in the past few years are now warning about chemical exposure, but don't worry. They're here to help. Well, consider me very, very skeptical. And I think this is just excuse making. I think they're trying to come up with the best excuses possible for their tyranny. And it's also a very important activity, right? Preventing toxins in the environment. I'm very much in favor of preventing toxins in the environment. The problem is they want to monopolize it and weaponize it. And that's what I can't stand. They'll keep putting neurotoxic fluoride in the water. They have no issue with that. That's a public health accomplishment, but they might come onto your property and test the soil and say, well, there's four parts per trillion of whatever. And three is the cutoff and then punish people, make people's lives. Hell, we really can't trust any government agency to do what their stated objective is. So oftentimes they invert their stated objective in their actual actions. But let's turn back to the ATSDR manual here. Environmental factors contribute to more than 25% of all diseases worldwide. In the United States, the yearly cost of just four childhood health programs linked to chemical exposures, lead poisoning, asthma, cancer, and developmental disabilities is greater than $54 billion. And this is another thing about socialized medicine. That's another excuse for fascism because they can say, well, we're spending way too much. We have to cut our costs. This isn't just about you. This is about our budget. So it says chemical exposures occur in homes, schools, workplaces, and throughout communities. Accidental releases, certain household products or hazardous sites are all possible causes of chemical exposures. Exposures that occur in the community may be difficult to identify and control. The Agency for Toxic Substances and Disease Registry, the ATSDR, works to safeguard communities from chemical exposures. ATSDR investigates community exposures related to chemical sites and releases, works closely with federal, tribal, state, and local agencies to identify potential exposures, assesses associated health effects, and recommends actions to stop, prevent, or minimize these harmful effects. Where have we heard this before? Actions to mitigate detrimental public health effects. I mean, how can people not learn over time? 
It says the ATSDR also responds during chemical spills and other emergency events. Agency scientists quickly advise local officials about when to evacuate communities and when to allow residents to return. Agency scientists quickly advise local officials about when to evacuate communities and when to allow residents to return. And this document really hones in on dioxin, which people are pretending like the EPA doesn't care about. This is obviously setting the stage for the next leg of this tyranny, for a huge campaign of environmental tyranny. So they had a graphic here I thought was interesting. I took a little snapshot. Love Canal started it all. Isn't that an interesting phrase? Love Canal started it all. So Love Canal is one of these super fun sites. Circla in New York. So they claim toxic chemicals were dumped here. Subsequently, the federal government passed the Superfund law. David Axelrod called the Love Canal incident a national symbol of a failure to exercise a sense of concern for future generations. So also dioxins are fingered as being one of the deadly chemicals. But what really concerns me is the evacuation. So they quote, tested the groundwater and later found the dump was three times larger than originally thought. He also discovered, talking about this guy Brown, who worked for a local newspaper, he also discovered that toxic dioxins were there. Oh, and the community got together and they demanded it, right? They gave the reaction for the solution. The grassroots organization, right? That's what they want us to believe. So the federal response. Congress passed the Comprehensive Environmental Response Compensation and Liability Act, CERCLA, better known as the Superfund Act. Love Canal became the first entry on the list. Evacuation. Eventually, the federal government relocated more than 800 families and reimbursed them for the loss of their homes. So they spent $15 million and they bought up 400 New York homes and demolished several rings of houses. That's not very much money. $15 million divided by 400 is just $37,500. So they got that land seemingly very, very cheap. So they forcibly evacuated, AKA relocated more than 800 families. And in this cutesy little way, this document says, Love Canal started it all. A little later in the document, it talks about dioxin in big print, dioxin quandary for the eighties. In 1983, the U S government permanently relocated the citizens of Times Beach, Missouri. The move followed a Centers for Disease Control and Prevention investigation into the health effects of widespread dioxin contamination. The health concerns identified by CDC galvanized action and set the stage, set the stage for what would become ATSDR. So I get very bad vibes from this group of people. This whole incident seems to be about targeting Republicans to support ecofascism, which will later be their downfall. So this is from the ATSDR document, seeking to avoid another love canal and compelled by the Times Beach, Missouri dioxin disaster. Congress passed the Comprehensive Environmental Response Compensation and Liability Act, CERCLA or Superfund in 1980. The Superfund gave EPA primary responsibility for identifying, investigating, and cleaning up what became known as National Priority List Sites or NPL. Superfund also created a new non-regulatory entity, the Agency for Toxic Substances and Disease Registry, the ATSDR. The ATSDR serves as one of the key federal agencies responsible for preventing toxic exposures, determining human health effects associated with exposures, and minimizing health risks. Many of ATSDR's activities are possible only through partnerships like a uh, FEMA. As an example, ATSDR often identifies the health effects of chemical exposures through data provided by EPA or state partners. It must then rely on EPA to implement its recommendations, obtain additional samples and clean up the chemical waste. And ATSDR lists out some of their partners, partnerships with the CDC, Chemical Safety and Hazard Investigative Board, Department of Defense, Department of Energy, 
Department of Homeland Security, the EPA, the Federal Emergency Management Agency, or FEMA, the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health, the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences, and look at this one, the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, or OSHA. I don't know about you, but I don't trust any of these people. Absolutely zero to do drastic public health actions over the environment. So the last little excerpt here, ATSDR also works closely with other federal, state, and local agencies to reach its goals. Partnerships enable ATSDR to gather data, conduct health studies, identify research needs, engage communities, and collaborate with public health professionals in developing and implementing recommendations to protect health and eliminate disparities in exposure. It's interesting wording there. And they have in big text, translating science into action. And I just want to remind people that science is oftentimes used to justify totalitarianism. Oh, this isn't us attacking you. This is the data driving our decisions. This is the science. We're just acting on the science. I don't think I even need to list out the examples, do I? So I was digging through the CDC website and I thought this was interesting. CDC talks about the public health assessment team and its functions. So it really jumps out at me. The public health assessment team helps to determine public health recommendations and communicate the findings and public health actions to the general public. They also talk about sending behavioral scientists into affected regions with the role of researching human behavior and its relationship with disease. Oh, look at that. Social engineering, training humanity. And whenever I see behavioral, I think of the behaviorists like BF Skinner, who starved a bunch of pigeons and meticulously measured how to use the hunger drive to train them to evoke the desired behavior. So research human behavior and its relationship with disease. Develop community-level and site-specific strategies for healthy behaviors to reduce harmful exposures. Strategies for healthy behaviors. So how to program everybody. They also design, analyze, and evaluate behavioral surveillance systems, public health interventions, health programs, and communication programs, aka propaganda. Also, we have the Community Involvement Specialists sent in to coordinate and oversee outreach and provide opportunities for community engagement in the public health assessment process. So their jobs are to earn and maintain a community's trust and then weaponize the trust, essentially help community members understand the PHA process, promote collaboration between all the different agencies inform and update communities about ATSDR's work, help communities understand the possible health impact. So I found a number of interesting databases looking into the history of evacuations from this group of eco agencies in the modern program is called the national toxic substances incidents program or the NTSIP. And the predecessor to this was called the HSEES. And there was the switch at around 2010 from HSEES to the NTSIP. So I don't want to spend too much time on the HSEES, but I find it very interesting. It's basically a database where they aggregate a bunch of alleged toxic exposure events. So we have a couple snapshots which show us how many times people have been forced to evacuate. It's a little hard to tell who's ordering these evacuations. Is it a private business telling their employees, hey, let's get out of this room? Or is it the state government coming in or the EPA coming in, forcing people out of their homes? But it's very startling to see how many evacuation orders there have been. And to think about how they can drive people off their land and into these 15 minute cities with this policy, with this angle. And that's what I'm on the lookout for. I feel like giving the government the power to rule over us using environmental excuses is way more dangerous than the threats they're pretending to save us from. But look at this, between 1993 and 1997, 514 evacuations were ordered. Between 1998 and 2001, it says 
2,359. Evacuation orders. Quote, official evacuation orders. Now again, I'm not sure what that means, but it sounds involuntary and ripe for political abuse. It says the number of persons evacuated ranged from 1 to 11,000. 5% involved 500 or more persons. That's a lot of people. So there's one incident where 11,000 people were evacuated. And then there's a decontamination, which is another very interesting aspect to all of this. Sounds very invasive and dystopian, frankly. Seems like this could be easily abused for political ends or to in fact poison people while pretending to save them, which seems to be a recurring pattern with this crew. So it says 2,341 employees were decontaminated. 1,449 members of the general public were decontaminated. So this opens up an entirely different concerning possibility with where they could go with this. Evacuations, decontaminations, dot, dot, dot. So we'll go over the rest of these stats real quick. In 2003, there were 531 evacuations ordered. In 2004, 499. In 2005, 481. In 2006, 503. Between 2007 and 2008, 1,155 ordered evacuations. Okay, so then they phased that database out and replaced it with the National Toxic Substances Incidents Program, the NTSIP. On their website, it says the NTSIP collects and combines information from many resources to protect people from harm caused by spills and leaks of toxic substances. The NTSIP gathers information about harmful spills into a central place. People can use, I think they're talking about the EPA, people can use NTSIP information to help prevent or reduce the harm caused by toxic substance incidents. NTSIP can also help experts when a release does occur. And interestingly, they have a photo of a train crash looking very similar to the aftermath of East Palestine. And I checked the Wayback Machine. This is not a new photo. That's been there. And this is a good time because we started the report talking about the ACE investigations, the assessment of chemical exposure investigations. And so I was able to track down that this is under the NTSIP under incident investigations on one of their resources. It says ACE. It says when large scale chemical incidents occur, state and local governments often need assistance to respond and collect pertinent information. A state can request the assistance of NTSIP's assessment of chemical exposures team, which will help characterize exposure data, as well as gather information about acute health effects that may result from exposure. So remember, we started the video talking about this press release. CDC and ATSDR staff begin next steps in ACE investigation. These results can be used by the states to help inform public health recommendations. So I went through the annual reports for the NTSIP, and here are some key stats in regards to evacuations. So from the report from 2013 to 2014, it says, in a majority of incidents requiring an evacuation order, 509 or 53.5 percent 50 or fewer people evacuated so it's a little confusing i have to think about what they're saying here i think they're saying that there's a total of 951 evacuation orders 509 of which required 50 or fewer people meaning 46 and a half percent of the 951 evacuation orders evacuated 50 or more really interesting how they worded this so they talk about residential evacuations for 148 different incidents and 40 commercial incidents. They also mentioned five agricultural incidents and two recreational incidents, which is very, very interesting given how the East Palestine EPA tyranny is rolling out. They're bringing in these very important concepts and they're trying to get people outraged and to demand this type of EPA intervention, which again, I think is a huge mistake and a socially engineered one at that. So this is interesting. This is a press release from the ATSDR where they're boasting about releasing their first annual report. Now, if you click the link, it takes you to the 2010 report, but this was published in 2014, this press release. 
so I don't claim to fully understand what's going on here. Maybe there's a delay of a few years by the time they publish the report. But it says here, did you know that each day, nearly the entire U.S. population is at risk for exposure from toxic substance spills? Oh, so everybody's at the mercy of this organization and the EPA. These are such broad government powers, and they're trying to ratchet this up and up and up. We'll talk about the recent moves by the EPA to add more and more chemicals onto CERCLA. We have to consider where this is going. The new infrastructure bill is throwing billions of dollars at this type of environmental fascism that's being ushered in. It says thousands of chemicals surround us at home, work, school, or play. We need to understand about the potential health effects of the chemicals we use every day. Enter CDC slash ATSDR's National Toxic Substances Incidents Program. It says the NTSIP collects and combines information from many resources professionals use to develop recommendations to protect people from harm caused by spills and leaks of toxic substances. This information can also help experts when a release occurs. So I think they're setting the stage, to use their own phrase, for many future events, for many future evacuations, farming restrictions, decontaminations. So talking about the NTSIP, this program has three goals. Build capacity at state health departments that, among other things, creates and implements community intervention strategies. Create and implement community intervention strategies. And the third goal here is also concerning. Support large-scale toxic substance incident investigations through assessment of exposure teams, ACE teams. So the ACE teams that we've been talking about. It says the data that this ACE team gathers will aid in promoting emergency response, FEMA, and preparedness activities, and in creating a cohort of exposed persons that can be followed to study long-term health effects. So more health surveillance. I opt out. I opt out. Here are two other experts that reiterate this point. Chemicals are everywhere threatening us, so the government needs to help with evacuations, decontaminations, fines, and banning certain chemicals. Each day, nearly the entire U.S. population is at risk for exposure from toxic substance spills. Thousands of chemicals surround us at home, work, school, or play. However, very little information exists about these chemicals and the potential threat they pose to the public when they are spilled. A recent study published by the World Health Organization, which is the United Nations, calculated the global burden of disease attributable to both acute and chronic toxic exposures in 2004 at 4.9 million deaths per year. So these are big claims. They're saying 5 million people are dying every year. So we need to give ourselves tons of powers to fight back against chemicals. Knowing these organizations, knowing these groups, this should raise major alarms to informed people. So again, the WHO put out a study saying 4.9 million deaths per year because of toxic exposure. Of this total burden, industrial and agricultural chemicals and acute poisonings accounted for a global disease burden of approximately 1.2 million deaths, or 2% of all deaths worldwide. So I guess what they're saying is 4.9 million deaths per year when you include air pollution and drinking water sources contaminated with arsenic. But if you look just at industrial and agricultural chemicals and acute poisonings, it goes down a bit to 1.2 million deaths. I mean, these are huge claims they're making. And so they can say, hey, yeah, your freedom is nice and all, but we're saving 5 million people a year. We have to clean up your land. You're evacuated. That's what really worries me. So they have a weird section here about state surveillance. In 2010, NTSIP partnered with state health departments to build surveillance capacity, identify vulnerable populations, where have we heard that phrase before, develop and implement community intervention strategies, and incorporate green chemistry initiatives. Doesn't sound good. There's an interesting table in this report, which talks about core data elements reported through the NTSIP. And this is something I think they're going to bring into the fold weather conditions. It seems like they're going out of their way to leave big piles 
of the soil and gravel they dug up from the train crash. And they're just leaving it sitting around. I think they're going to say, oh my gosh, it rained. And the contamination spread. I really do think they're playing out on the world stage. This big spectacle. To get people to buy into this agenda. And that makes this all so much more sinister. Under response, it says decontamination performed. So there's that word again, decontamination. Entry restrictions. Evacuations and road closures. So shutting down the arteries of the country, shutting down the train lines, evacuations, travel restrictions, entry restrictions, decontamination. They also have reporting requirements, which I can see as being a big part of this agenda and tying in directly with CERCLA. Under response and evacuation, emergency response, the majority, 2,475 or 83% did not require any actions to protect public health. So very interesting wording there. That's them saying 17% required actions to protect public health. The idea of protecting public health historically has been abused time and time again for totalitarianism. Look at the Nazi eugenics, which came from the American eugenics. Just as one example, we also lived through another agenda over the past few years, which we should have learned from. Evacuation and in-place sheltering. Evacuation occurred when an exposure required people to leave the contaminated area for the protection of their health. In 2010, there were 522 incidents requiring an ordered evacuation, while an additional 51 incidents resulted in an ordered in-place shelter. So it's interesting too, the number of people evacuated. Look at how they word this. The majority of incidents that required an ordered evacuation, 352 or 67.4%, required the evacuation of 50 or fewer people. So that means 32.6% were 51 people or more, which are big evacuations. I think this is really interesting too. Oftentimes we see these exercises that end up looking very similar to what ends up happening on the world stage. For example, look at this. The NTSIP planned tabletop exercise to pilot test their software. So they worked with Kenosha County Health Department, Kenosha County, and they selected the recreational complex, which is a term that we keep hearing talked about when it comes to the soil samples. We've covered this previously. I don't want to spend too much time on it, but they keep talking about recreational areas in East Palestine. And to see if they're effective, they need to test the soil. That's what they're telling us. So they say this residential complex, RecPlex, serves between 800,000 and 1 million people and is located near an Amtrak rail line. It says, in addition, two chemical processing plants and a major regional electrical power generating station are located less than one and a half miles from the facility. This is the key line. NTSIP staff and partners from other state agencies conducted a tabletop exercise simulating a freight train derailment. So they've run at least one dress rehearsal exercise. And how interesting, given their powers to evacuate people, to restrict access, farming, other activities, that they were practicing just this, a freight train derailment. We've covered this previously, but this really concerns me. These are actions that the ATSDR may recommend, which include forced evacuations under actions to cease or reduce exposures. Recommended actions may include removing physical hazards, establishing institutional control on land use, restricting public use of or access to a site, restricting use of drinking water supplies, establishing measures to restrict contaminant migration, remediating contaminant sources, and finally, evacuating or relocating populations, which is so evil and antithetical to freedom and property ownership. And I've covered previously in other articles and videos the intricacies of CERCLA and some landmines that I think have been set there purposefully to be exploited by this new angle of environmental eco-fascism. So let's cover a few of EPA's recent actions. So on their page about the East Palestine train crash and explosion, they talk about soil sampling and air monitoring. 
It says the EPA and Norfolk Southern contractors continue to take soil samples at agricultural, commercial, recreational, and residential properties in both Ohio and Pennsylvania. So look, they're checking all of these boxes. These are the terms that we kept seeing pop up when they were talking about evacuations. This is what we kept seeing pop up, agricultural, commercial, recreational, and residential. What are the odds? In their source material, we kept seeing these talked about. Many times when they reported the number of evacuations, they tell us agricultural, recreational, industrial, and or commercial stats. That's worrisome to me. It goes on to say, 80 soil samples have been collected. This soil sampling effort will help identify if contaminants, including SVOCs and dioxins, are present and may have been caused by the train derailment. I really have a bad feeling about this. I think eventually they'll announce they found dioxins and it's a dangerous level. Everyone has to leave. People can't farm. People can't raise or sell their livestock. That's where I see this going. And I think this is just the prototype response that'll be used in a cookie cutter fashion across the country. Under air quality, this is concerning too. Air monitoring continues 24 seven at 23 stations. It says, this includes continuous air monitoring and sampling at the site and throughout the community, as well as the use of EPA's Trace Atmospheric Gas Analyzer, TAGA, mobile laboratory, which is conducting an air monitoring route. Now, this is one of the biggest bombshells I found today. The EPA came out March the 14th, 2023, calling themselves, quote, Biden's EPA and announcing that they are trying to ban certain chemicals at levels over a few parts per trillion. I get a really bad feeling about where this is going. I don't know how anybody can trust these actors. So look at this press release. This is from the EPA, and they're calling themselves the Biden-Harris administration. They're talking about EPA's actions and talking about it as Biden-Harris administration or Biden's EPA. So here's their headline. Biden-Harris administration proposes first ever national standard to protect communities from PFAS in drinking water. Now, for the record, I'm obviously for clean drinking water. I don't want PFASs in people's drinking water. But I don't think this is going to end well. I think they're going to keep tacking on more and more chemicals. They're going to do more and more surveillance. It's going to be politicized more and more. Used to usher people into these 15-minute cities used to attack the drinking water supply, used to attack the food supply, farming, livestock raising, etc. And I hope I'm proven wrong, but I know it's a huge mistake to trust the government. So I think I'll be right. So they've added six new chemicals, per and polyfluoroacyl substances, PFAS, in the latest action under President Biden's plan to combat PFAS pollution. The EPA is taking a major step to protect public health from PFAS pollution, leveraging the latest science and complementing state efforts to limit PFAS by proposing to establish legally enforceable levels. Uh oh, I think we see where this is going. Legally enforceable levels for six, count them six, PFAS known to occur in drinking water. This proposal builds on other key milestones to combat PFAS, including EPA's proposal to designate two PFAS as circular hazardous substances. So I don't know about you, but these pieces are starting to come together in my mind and I'm seeing where this is going. It's pretty obvious where this is going. And I think the phrase eco-fascism is a good moniker. They also talk about nationwide sampling for 29 PFAS in public drinking water systems. Using the EPA's Clean Water Act, to reduce PFAS pollution in the environment from industry and initiating the distribution of $10 billion in funding to address emerging contaminants under the bipartisan infrastructure law. It's never good when it's bipartisan. Today's actions represent a significant milestone for the Biden-Harris administration's commitment to combat PFAS pollution in safeguard drinking water. Do you trust Biden's administration to safeguard drinking water? 
Biden has secured historic funding to address emerging contaminants like PFAS, including $10 billion. That's so much money from the bipartisan infrastructure law. In February 2023, the EPA announced the availability of $2 billion from President Biden's bipartisan infrastructure law to address emerging contaminants, including, but not limited to, I guess, PFAS in drinking water across the country. So when I read between the lines with my skeptical mind, I feel like I can see where this is going. Look who's cheerleading it. NBC News and CNN both rushed to announce the new EPA push to outlaw certain PFAS chemicals. So here are some headlines. NBC News. EPA proposes rule targeting forever chemicals in drinking water. CNN. EPA proposes first standards to make drinking water safer from forever chemicals. Interesting, too, that they're calling this the first standards implying that they'll continue to move the goalposts in future proposals. Oh, these are the first standards. Biden-Harris administration proposes first ever national standard. Oh, the first. There's usually a reason why you'd call something the first, because you expect more.